Uh, we're now up to the second round, and uh, I'll just go right through the same order. I think, Kevin, you're up next for uh, follow-on comments. Great. Wow, this has been great. Um, I, yeah, I have a few things. I mean, you know, I'm trying to think about how, how, how do we get here? <laughs> how did things get to this point where there's really all these systems that don't talk to each other? And I, I, as people were talking, I was just trying to list out what I see as kind of the, the, the high level elements that are driving this. Um, one is, um, to, to be realistic, you know, when we're talking about human services transportation, the bond response transportation, we're talking about a niche within a niche. I mean, um, the, the, uh, we're, we're talking about an industry that is magnitude, orders of magnitude smaller than most other industries that um, need interoperability. You know, when you talk, compare ourselves to rail or airlines or, uh, you know, Logistics, you know, we're just, uh, we don't have the kind of capital that a lot of industries have. So that's one element. Um, so uh, in the way, my own third hand, I mean, my own um, sort of uh, shorthand for that is I just say we're, we're in third world conditions. You know, we just have, we don't have a lot available. And, and we talk about small agencies in rural area, in, in the rural areas, it, it really is. We talk about red, fair um, budgets. So we, you know, the solutions that we come up with need to take that into account. Second of all, we don't have any Google. There's no Google. There's no, we're not going to get a Google who's going to come in and say, you know, uh, we see a lot of money to be made here, and so we're going to uh, create a de facto uh, format that we think might be taken up by the industry as a whole. We, that's, not, that's not happening. None of us should be waiting for that to happen. Um, and this is in no particular order, so but I'll, I'll just kind of go through. Now that we're talking about open standards here, um, we're, we want open standards, but we're not in a situation where we're talking about open data. So there's a lot of people talking about open data in government right now, and that's very kind of a, a sexy thing in, the, in, in a lot of uh, tech world and open source worlds. But we're not talking about open data here. There, that is true on the level of service discovery, as um, Brendan and, and um, 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 Thank you, Roger. Uh, we're saying um, at that level, we do want open data at service discovery. But when it comes to talk, talking about exchanging trip data, and billing, and all that, we're not talking about um, open trip, open data. We're talking about something that's more akin to electronic medical records, right? We want to keep things secure. We want to keep things not open, right? That's really vital. So how do we have a process where the data is not open, but um, the process by which we transfer that data around is open. So it's a different challenge from the GTFS in that sense. Um, second of all, we're talking about really um, complex business rules. Um, you know, Brendan was talking about the life cycle of a trip. Um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, every major bullet point that Brendan talked about, you dig down into it and there's a million little elements to it. And there's a great deal of variance from agency to agency. So. Uh, that's going to be challenging, um, uh, and 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 on a technical level, when we get down to talking about allocating requests to capacity, um, then we come up with uh, a, a very complex uh, technical challenge. So, if you're familiar in, in tech worlds with the, the traveling salesman problem, um, that is, how do you? What's the best? The traveling salesman. It's a technical um, puzzle which is, uh, given that a traveling salesman needs to go to 20 different locations, what's the shortest route? If the, if the order doesn't matter, what's the shortest route to get um, to all those different locations? It turns out that the best way to find out what the shortest route is, is to examine every single permutation of routes. That's how you find out. Um, so that, there's a name for that, it's called NP-hard um, calculation. So there's that level of it. There's ways to get around that, but when we're talking about trying to solve the problem of multiple agencies trying to figure out how to allocate their services together. That's complex. Um, and, uh, and then getting down to agencies and kind of the situation is we, we, um, we have a situation where, again, there's not a lot of money, as we said earlier. And also, the most agencies have basically deferred their, this pro these problems to vendors. So they don't have technologists on staff. They don't have programmers and they don't have business analysts. 
who are taking a look at what is the best thing for us? What's the best thing you know, in our interests, in our situations? What's going to meet our needs the most? Um, and so a lot of that is getting, um, those questions are being answered by vendors. And the, there's a key problem there in that um, the market uh, incentives are not in place to get the best solutions for agencies in this situation. I think there's a lot of other situations where vendors do provide the best possible solution because it's in their interest, but when we're talking about this coordination and interoperability and data standards, it really, you're, you're asking the vendor to talk to another vendor, exchange data with them, and basically provide an avenue where the, uh, the customer can more easily leave their system. They're not gonna just do that on their own. And, and because we don't have our own technologists at the agencies, we're not putting these things that are difficult for a vendor to do in our requirements. So there's no incentive, there's no position from which the vendors are saying, oh, okay, you know, we're, we're just gonna start this initiative for interoperability. There's no incentive for them to do it. It needs to come from the agencies to require it. And that's not happening. So it's so that's kind of for me the perfect storm. I think I have you know I've got my own thoughts about how we can respond to those things. So for you know the fact that agencies don't have technologists, there's a solution to that. We can start hiring technologists. That's not necessarily easy because it's a very hot market for uh, technologists right now, um, and it can be difficult to hire um, or contract for that. But that's possible. Um, and you know as um, I think. As I heard Roger say, you know, um, we don't want to be coming up with the final solution right off the bat. There's no going to be, there aren't going to be turn key solutions here. So we're going to have to iterate. We're going to have to, you know, we are walking in the woods at night with a very weak flashlight. <laughs> and we'll just have to allow ourselves the possibility to, to make mistakes, iterate, fall off the path, get back on. Um, that involves taking risks um, and having risks be part of the course and have that be part of the expectations industry-wide. Um, that's already happened. I mean, obviously, you know, some of the MSAA things didn't work out perfectly, and that's fine. Um, that's gonna happen with the VTCLI projects also, and that needs to be part of the course, or else we're not gonna make any progress if there can't be some risk. Um, and we need to collaborate. So, you know, this is, uh, which is the thing we're doing right now. So, um, so I feel like, I'm very hopeful, but I think that kind of covers uh, some of the major issues that I see. I think there's one thing, <clears throat> there's one thing to be said about technology here, that as I listen to this, there's a really good thing about technology, is technology you can leapfrog. If, if you're doing an industrial process, you have to go step A, step B, step D, D and so on. But technology, you can leapfrog ahead, and in my region, the technology is really lagging. They're slow, they're behind, which is, in technology, is really a good thing because you can leapfrog ahead. You don't have to go through all the inter intermediary heartaches that some of you have, these other regions have already done. So technology is great in that sense is I can, I can leapfrog some of those problems. The second thing that comes to my mind listening to this is there are different flavors of technologists. And if you have a technology manager or vendor or somebody that comes to you and says, you outline everything you want done and I'll program you something to do that. In this milieu, if they tell you that to you, don't walk away, run away. Because you cannot define it all. You cannot outline all the steps that need to be done and some guy goes off in the dark corner and does it. it it can't be done that way. I mean, that's the big pitfall that I've seen. So technology can leap ahead, but you have to choose the flavor of technology that allows you to do small things, see if it's successful or not successful, and go on and do another small thing. You can't, you can't make one glorious grand leap to utopia. Okay. Um, well, we've said a lot in the last half an hour here, that's for sure. Um, you know, I, I, one thing I want to follow up on what uh, Lee just said is, 
you know, technology, we at Mart, uh, again, we've deployed an enormous amount of technology for our brokerage uh, and for our transit, and, and for our transit, we have the ABLs and, and all that. Um, you know, but one thing we learned in, in the first round of, um, um, uh, probably about 10 or so years ago, 10, 11 years ago, we really started doing a lot of more and more we took on the uh, human service work in Massachusetts is that, um, you know, the first few rounds that we did with technology were all about what would be good for merit and what would, you know, speed up merit processes and you know, take less time and, and all that. And it, that was very nice, but unfortunately, we got a lot of blowback from the vendors because they're the actual transportation providers. Because it's like it's really good for you, but now you know we're doing all this extra work on our end, and it's you know it, it's causing a lot of extra work for our uh, you know whether it might be uh, invoicing people or, or whatever, maybe gets back to the schedule or so. So uh, very early on, in, 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 in uh, all subsequent things where we deployed any type of technology, whether it was complaint management or invoicing, or whatever, um, you know what we tried to do was do something that benefits everybody. You know, Mark gets something out of it, the vendors get something out of it, the state, you know, do all the work for it, get something out of it, so that you know, everybody benefits. And, and I think that really is how this whole thing has to be approached, is that it can't just be that, you know, what it, it benefits, you know, maybe the vendor, it's easy for the vendor to deploy something, but, you know, the agencies don't get what they need out of it, uh, or, or vice versa, or certainly the end result is here is, is the customers. And um, one thing that struck me was, you know, when you're talking to Mary, it's kind of in the state with Massachusetts got a, a lot of transit um, uh, uh, in place. It's a very good infrastructure. I mean, not all states, speaking of, you know, when, when we're sitting in this group with um, Barbara Donovan from Vermont, I mean, they have a transit agency, but it's, I mean, it's, it's all little agencies across the state, and there's very little technology deployed up until it releases current RFP. And I mean, they're literally, you know, calling in between agencies that are, you know, hundreds of miles apart, trying to get people, you know, do you have room on your van that's going to the Springfield Mass for somebody going to, you know, some type of you know, cancer treatment or dialysis or whatever it may be. And, and for them, I mean, for us, we're trying to get more people moved on, you know, vehicles, which we're already doing quite a bit. Um, and for them, it's, you know, imperative because if that person came to up with somebody else, they may not go because there's just no other vehicle available. So I, I think, you know, just hearing this is that I, I think, um, you know, the, the initial crack at this, and again, what Roger said is this, and, and what we've identified on our end is this very minimalist approach to data. Um, you know, that so that you know, I have the vendors fighting over, you know, I'm, I'll put that in the air, but I won't put this in the air. Uh, and I think from, from our end, that's what we really want to do. I mean, I think this is a golden opportunity with the veterans grants. Uh, everybody wants to help the veterans out, uh, and, and, and it's certainly a, a kind of a point in time where I think, you know, to get everybody on the same page at the same time, and again, with whatever minimal uh, um, uh, you know, data sets and protocols we can put in place and then try to roll that out kind of generically amongst ourselves and, and I think it's true that we are probably going to have some things where people you know may will draw from some or look at other ones differently but I, I really think the, the time is, is right for you know, trying to trying to get something where everybody can agree to some some uh, minimalist approach and protocol where you know everybody can agree that this is what you would include uh, I, I think a lot of what was in the idea of 50 Report, you know, maybe something along those lines was a fairly straight, straight shot of, of uh, you know, data elements. So, I mean, I think that's what we should probably be trying to concentrate on is, you know, what what's the common ground? And, and I agree that we're not going to, you know, you can't solve everything at once. And, and I think what we do at Matt is a lot of times, you know, we don't just you know, try to buy, you know, the software vendor we have. We're not just buying versions of software. We actually develop modules that solve specific problems. I and mean, we don't care about bells and whistles. We just want, you know, I want to solve the problem. I don't need all sorts of, you know, alerts and all sorts of different things. I really just need to solve a specific problem. And that's what we try to do with this. So I, I think that's really where we may want to you know, try to focus all of our efforts, you know, people in this room and anybody else who joins is that, you know, try to solve very specific problems and with minimalist approaches so that you know, there's not like people trying to throw extras in, pull pieces up, because that, that will rapidly go down the same road we've been down many times and just, you know, all of a sudden everybody's off in different, different, uh, different venues and, and we're not where we need to be. So uh, that, that would be my, my take on this is that, I think, you know, how do we agree on the common approach here, uh, you know, for the minimal approach? And then let's you know, start out with small steps and see if we can get running here. Thank you, Bruno. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I, I had actually, I was talking with one of our vendors, one of the project managers um, of a software suite, and talking about his work with uh, interoperability and, and any type of translation work that you know he's had experience with, and 
and he had mentioned that they did do a project, um, you know, no names or anything like that, but they, they had did, done a project before, one of the, and they were wishing and hoping that they had never taken it on because it ended up costing way too much money, more, way more than, you know, they thought or budgeted for, and, um, and out of it, they ended up with one piece, you know, we we're able to translate this from that, but nothing else. And so uh, some of the problems that, that he had um, laid to me were getting that set of data. And it sounds like, uh, de or defining rather, defining what data needs to be translated and what you're looking for. Uh, and it sounds like some work is, is already being done on that uh, aspect, and that's great. Um, because it really is, once you start adding in, and, and as many of the other panelists have mentioned, um, you start with this set, and then if you try to complicate the problem too much in your initial uh, run rundown, you're just creating this huge bear of a problem that um, really doesn't need to be there. You know, so really that minimal minimalist approach of what data really needs to go through, um, but you do need vendor buy-in. You know, and it's something where um, you really can't force things into systems. You don't want to go voiding the warranty by uh, placing things into databases where they don't belong or, or you don't have the full picture and you get your black box. So you need vendor to buy in. Um, and I think you'd mentioned that, um, you know, well, why would they? It allows you to, to leave, leave their system. And, and that's a great point. And I was thinking about that myself, too. I've come to that conclusion of, well, you're making vendors put in this thing that makes this migration to another piece of software easier. Um, vendors should look at that as a benefit because if their software is better than the original <laughs> software that, that the uh, agency is dealing with, and it should be, then that makes it easier for them to come into your software as opposed to leave your software. <laughs> so uh, I think you know, as long as everyone's developing these uh, the products that they're proud of, it should be. Um, something that they want to happen is make that migration easier or, or just, you know, if it's just um, trips for the next X number of days to be able to get into the system so that it's an easier migration, then, um, then great. Um, but having that liability issue with vendors as well um, is something you really need them to buy in um, to be able to do. And, security is a huge uh, concern with this, as, as was already mentioned as well, where you know we do need to translate this data, but it needs to be done in a secure fashion. So as we walk through this, this should always be in our mind. This is sensitive data, it's not open data. So. Brenda? Oh, uh, two things that, that I've been thinking about has been very, very interesting. The first one is I agree about the simple, you know, trying to you know, all of us sort of try to make it simple because of to, to keep it manageable. But in the specific circumstance we're talking about, uh, going back to Roger's point about class, you know, uh, the trip request is related to eligibility determination. And there are an infinite number of classes of applications. So I guess it's a challenge of how do you keep, you know, characterizing the trip with a person on a trip. I can see that can be very easy. But the whole purpose is to allocate people to capacity, but the rules of the use of that capacity are very complicated and depend on the program, and depend on whether the person's eligible to that program. I don't, and there's no standardization of the classes, of, like in the airlines, mm -hmm. so that, you know, you can't, I just don't know how you would simplify the problem. So I leave that as a challenge of how do you, you know, you can deal with the downstream stuff pretty easily. Well, you can't even do that because the billing and reporting all deals with eligibility too. You can deal with the middle stuff about, you know, just no shows and stuff like that. But so that, I leave that as a challenge because if you can't, I don't see how we're going to, I don't know, it's just a challenge. I don't, I, I see it's an important part about that because trip request is related to the eligible determination and that relates to the class, the, the concept of class. So. The second one is institutionally. 
is the role of the state um, in for transit and ADA paratransit and a lot of other programs and brokerage, Medicaid brokerage indirectly, the state plays a critical role. It's not quite as clear to me in the BTCLI what their role is, but the states are going to play an important role for technology assistance, technology support for all the small providers where there isn't any support out there. There is no technologist on staff. There never will be. But at a state level, you could envision. Now, some states have gone ahead and done common procurements, which deals with it in a specific way, and that's fine. But for all those states who haven't gone that path, is there a role to have a shared resource? I don't see the state associations doing that, because they tend to be extremely small, and they don't have enough commonality in those states. But the state DOTs should, but I don't think they have a real big role in the BTCLI program. So I just throw that out as another challenge. I, the states are a critical piece of the puzzle, but I don't see how they get involved in this process. So. I'm just going to try to throw a little monkey wrench in here. When, uh, when we deal about with, uh, with data and, and uh, transit technology and stuff, we often think about our own organization or our own location. And gen in general, everybody has, not everybody, but most of us have a SQL server or an Oracle server storing all of our data and we can just go and query it whenever we want. The latest fad that I've seen out there is this hosted environment because it costs them less money, okay? And they don't need to have a transit technology guy or a database administrator or anything like that. Now the joy to this though is you don't have access to your data, okay? Now when you don't have access to your data, how can you then take that data and translate it? I don't have an answer, okay? But I'm just throwing that little monkey wrench in there. Something we gotta be thinking about and when we're talking to vendors and stuff like that, that the data is your data if you are at the transit authority or you know, the, the provider. That data should be your data. You should have access to it, not just through some ad hoc reporting system, but somehow an FTP or something or a, a nightly upload of the database from the, uh, the their data center or something to that effect. Because otherwise, everybody won't be able to share the data because they can't even get at their own data. So just throwing that in there to make things a little bit more complicated, as if it wasn't enough already, but um, something to think about. Yeah, let me just respond to that. Um, that you know, I understand that that's a concern, but um, that's not a reality-based concern, unfortunately. It doesn't matter where data is these days. It's accessible. We, um, our, our clients, are all hosted on Amazon. It doesn't matter whether they're hosted on Amazon or in their office. Their folks can get to their data just the same the, the way they could before. Well, some some of the the software, and I, I don't want to get into names. I don't want to get well, but names. That's, but that's but that's but, not a technology issue. Well, that's a vendor implementation practice or right. policy. Well, I, I, in that case, I nothing do to agree do with, with technology whatsoever. I do agree with you on that case then. But the business, you know, the fact, I mean, again, I mean, if you're stuck in that situation with the vendor, of course, it doesn't, you don't care with it. Right. <laughs> well, 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 that's what I'm saying is <laughs> that when, when people are approaching vendors, they need to make sure yes, that absolutely. they have access to their own data. Right. Okay. Otherwise, yes. you know, the rest of it's, the point is moot. And I have seen instances throughout the country where people have data in some data center but don't know how to get at it. And then you talk to the, um, the, the company and because of security, they won't let you get at it. So I'm just throwing that out. No, that's a good point. I mean, again, it, it's not a technology issue per se, but I think it's a very good point. If, if vendors are doing those sorts of things, and that's very unfortunate in terms of the perception that it, 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 it creates to the customers. All right, we're, we're at the point now where it's, it's open. We, we played the game using the, using the <laughs> zone plays, now it's free wheel. And that includes the, the audience here. Includes that's anybody in the saying. audience. Let me ask, uh, first, anybody have a, a quick response to anything they need to do right now before we go to the audience? 
Um, I just have one one thing. I mean, there's something, a couple of comments were made along the way, which I think are really important, um, which sort of speak to what's the incentives or motives for the quote unquote vendor, I'll call, I'll call them software provider, that's my preferred terminology, software provider community to be involved in this. And I think it's it, there's some simple math involved. There's what, seven or eight software providers in this space. Um, if they all had to build interfaces to each other, let's just use seven, that's seven squared minus seven or 42 interfaces. If we build one standard, or they could build one standard API to a, a standard data set. It, it's really pretty, it, it's straightforward. Everybody's better off if they build one API to standardize data. It's just very, very simple. I, following that on, there was some concern that about vendor, what I guess I'll call, um, what's the word I'm looking for, tie-in, that you're sort of stuck with the vendor, and that if you go to standardized data, you're loosened up. I, you know, that that's a, I, no, I, I, that's not true at all. Standardized data makes it mo no more likely that you're going to go from vendor A to vendor B at some future point in time. What it does make more likely is that if there's another product that sits on top of your core scheduling and reservation system that vendor B has and is competitive for vendor A, then vendor A won't have you locked up. And there are a couple software companies that I talked to in the last few weeks that I think are thinking that's not a bad, you know, strategic, you know, approach to take is to to do that. At the same time, they also said that they're interested in standard data. But it doesn't really make it any easier to migrate from one software application to another. That's always a big deal, it always will be. So I just wanted, and finally, um, I don't believe it is a true statement that eligibility determination has strong implications for uh, capacity, what I'll call capacity management. Eligibility determination is something that's handled on the reservation side of paratransit reservations and scheduling systems. And whatever service restrictions are placed upon uh, certain types of riders will be handled at that point. And presumably, we part of standardized data is to communicate whatever those service restrictions would be as part of the data standard. So I don't think it's the case that we have to be terribly concerned about eligibility determination being so fine-grained that it's going to make data interoperability a major problem. Can I, I, just, I don't think you understood. Um, the, what did I understand? The, well, the issue about eligibility determination is not just on the capacity, but you can't even place a trip request unless that's part of the definition of the person. I mean, they have to be placing a trip request for a specific kind of service. So it required, it, it's related to your class issue of the airlines. I mean, they, you know, there's a, a class, economy class, business class, so forth. Right. Well, if you're placing a, you know, a trip that's a workshop trip versus a Medicaid trip or something else, that's got to be part of the trip request process, doesn't it? It's you're handling it on the you're handling it on the reservation side. If I put it out to the world of capacity and say it's a workshop trip, it's going to be put out as a workshop trip. I've already right. determined the eligibility. Right. Okay. I've determined the eligibility. If 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 I can't handle workshop trips, if my if the if the, if the service provider is not able to handle workshop trips, you know they can't. They won't even see this trip. No, no, I don't, okay, I take it on that because in a one call, one click environment, the per, anybody can call into the system. They don't call a specific number just for workshop trips or another. They, they call into a central, you know, it's a portal. With, well, with but internet. I, I, I and so then I, they have wait, to wait, have wait, a, But I wasn't, I wasn't, data standards don't necessarily have to have anything to do with one call, one click. One call, one click is a specific type of software application. Data standards have n don't 
again, let's separate out data standards from business applications. Let's not conflate the two. Yeah. Well, I think. <laughs> yeah, I think. I think it's a confusion there. It is. It is going to be interesting because I mean, you know, when we talk about eligibility, there's. That's where you have a great deal of variety from region to region. What it means, you know, what a service level, how that's described in Montana is going to be completely different from how it's described in Portland, from how it's going to be described in Texas. And so, um, and the, the, the rules and their standings and sort of like, you know, each state has taken its own sort of um, evolutionary path in terms of how to describe these things. And so when we try to, like, Take a description of eligibility and, um, and 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 apply a general idea of eligibility uh, and and make that in a way that we can put it in a data format and use it both in Montana and Texas and Portland and in, and wherever else. Um, I think we're going to that's we're just again we're in the forest with flashlight that's not very strong and, yeah, and I, how I, that's going to work I, from I, a I think, data I format think, level I, I think is going to take a while. I think the eligibility situation is way over. Yeah. Way, way, way overblown. I mean, when people bring these situations to me, you know, it's like it's always the one or two percent. We don't need to deal with the one or two percent on day one and data standards. Mm -hmm. We don't need to, we don't want to deal with the one or two percent. That would defeat the whole purpose. I, yeah, I, I would come down on the side that eligibility really complicates it. We have a situation in my region where they applied true eligibility to trips, and the number of trips went from 16 million in a year to 12 million in a year. So those eligibility, the customer, rightly or wrongly, wants to go to all sorts of places. The payments may not follow going to a hair salon as opposed to a medical solution. So eligibility comes back, haunts you with payment. And so the eligibility, I would come down on the side is a big problem, and it it there's no sense even looking at the trip if it's not eligible, and so then it has to get into all those esoteric questions about you know can this payment stream follow me to a hair salon, but not to a medical or to a medical but not to a hair salon, and, and that eligibility does impact. But that's your reservation system, right? That's your reservation system. That's if I, if I want to fly and I am not eligible for some class of service, then there won't be any seats that are shown to me. This is the same principle. That's why I'm saying we overcomplicate our life by getting we're, we're, we're upstream decisions will be made upstream. What needs to happen downstream will happen downstream. We make those upstream decisions every day of the week today. So somehow it's happening. It is but, happening. Right. But what's happening is it's, in hap it's happening incorrectly. From 16 million to 12 million is a big difference. And, and the people paying the 12 million were paying 16 million and they said, we don't like this. And so we're not even gonna look at reserving the trip unless it's an eligible trip. So I mean, if we're not talking one two percent here, we're talking. But that's fine. Is there is is that a problem that we went from sixteen to twelve? Now tell me why it's a problem we went from sixteen to twelve. If eligibility were tightened up, is that a? I, I don't see the problem. It's I, a problem I, I'm for, trying to see the for problem here. Well, no, it's a problem for the people getting the trip. But if they're not right. eligible for the trip in the first, I, I mean, I, 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 I come with double brother on this side. I mean. We go, I mean, we have, again, a very large system, I mean, but when these people call, we know what they're eligible for, you know, Mass Health, other agencies under um, uh, Health and Human Service, ADA, whatever. Um, so, I mean, I don't see, I mean, again, maybe I'm, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm uh, just to uh, become too uh, immune to, to, to uh, have to look at individual problems, but I mean, if someone calls for a service for which they are not eligible, and they don't get that right, I mean, to me, so the agency doesn't pay it. Now, I understand what they're saying. I mean, that, you know, at the end of the day, you know, a person who may have been going, however, whatever agency may have been paying for it, either correctly or incorrectly, uh, I understand that that person doesn't get their ride, and that's important that, you know, the person needs to get where they need to go. But from just a pure, straight business application side here, which I, this is really all this is, is if somebody's calling for a Medicaid ride and they're not eligible for Medicaid, 
that Medicaid shouldn't be paying for that ride. And, and, and my trip reservation should say, sorry, Bob, you can't go on Mass Health because you're not either eligible for that doctor or, or even for Medicaid. So, uh, the, the, just, uh, just to come back, I, and I agree, and I didn't want to raise the ordinance in this, I'm just, <laughs> the reason, but I'm looking at it from a slightly mm -hmm. higher level, but within the TMCC concept, we're automating even that call in to the process. So you don't know in advance if the person is eligible or not for Medicaid, and then you schedule it. The person calls in and can be eligible for all sorts of different things. You can go in through a portal, you can go in through the, into a 1-800 number. And then ideally, the vision I'm talking about is that that person would put in sufficient information to determine what class they are eligible for, and then their business rules about where it could be or could not be allocated. Right. All I was raising is that there has to be, it, it's not just the name of the person's enough, you know, in simple Oh, no, I, I agree. And, and, and you so know, it's I just think, that class issue that there would be, I think whether that, it's an issue or not. But and it I think the bigger it. problem is it, that that's not really a problem uh, that's going to be solved by the, you know, by the provider or the broker. That is a problem with many states really not, I mean, when we first started out with this MSAA, um, and, and I rapidly realized, you know, early on in the first round, you're not going to get a second round because many of the places that we're playing were, I mean, they were still doing pencil and paper and just phone calls, and I mean, there is no coordination at all, there is no idea who's eligible for what, and so I think the problem is more on the state end, at least from the way I see it, is that, I mean, if states or, or whoever may run it, counties, I mean, every state's really different, but if there's not a, Clearing house for how, what people are eligible for, or what they're applying for. Then there's a bigger problem that, that the broker or, or whatever you want to call the person who's doing the clearing house, one call, one click, etc. That's not going to be solved by that person. And, and I realize that's different in different you know some states that that's who they're looking for to solve the problem. But you know, the one call, one click center can't be the place that determines whether you are eligible for a state service for which somebody else is paying. I mean, he's saying, yeah, sure, I'll get a mass health or, or you know, Medicaid. I'm not sure if you're really going to get, if I'm going to get paid for that. I mean, so, so I think that's more of a, that's more of a, uh, whoever's setting up for it to have these different long call, one click centers across a state or counties or whatever it may be, who's ever expecting them to do that work, has got to step up to the plate and figure out a system by which they tell you, you know, you know, here's who's eligible, you know, for the entire county, or if that's how it's done in the state, here's who's eligible for these various services. Because once you get it in the software, for us it's very simple. I can say you know, you're eligible for you know, three or four different types of service, and maybe what is most advantageous with what, what, what cost me, or, or whatever. But it certainly I don't think it can be left up to the one call, one click center to say like you know they're going to call in, you're going to schedule them for a ride, and you may or may not get reimbursed. That's really not a problem for the. It, it's a problem for the agency that's not getting reimbursed, but it really shouldn't be their problem to figure out who's eligible. That, that's more of a business problem. You tell me who is eligible, and I'll I'll get them where they need to go.